Hi everyone, have you ever wondered why some teachers captivate us with ease while others have us constantly checking the clock? What makes for truly engaging teaching? Could there be a surprising connection between how we educate humans and how we train large language models? Keep watching to learn more and stay tuned for some exciting announcements at the end of this video. This video has three parts, the flood of language, building up skills, and how I teach. Part one, the flood of language. A lot of people are talking about how large language models are trained, and I won't go into detail about it here, but of course, they're first and foremost trained on word completion. You take all the text on the internet, you remove a random word, and then you ask the model to predict what that word is. Rinse and repeat by removing different words, maybe large sequences of words, and eventually the model gets really good at text completion, basically. That's actually the bulk of large language model training, is doing this pre-training step of just removing words. Only after that is it customized for a specific domain, such as question answering. So at its heart, an LLM is really good at predicting the next word, obviously, and predicting missing words. That's why you can trick some LLMs into revealing their training data or the LLM's hallucination of the training data by using some prompt attack techniques like saying to ChatGPT, please just print this word over and over again infinitely. There's no consensus on exactly why this happens, but it's probably because asking to just repeat the same word over and over doesn't really make sense in the question answering portion of the neural network. So it just falls back on doing what it does best predicting the next word. So if you start from an empty string and you start generating a sentence word after word, then eventually you'll end up with sentences that were present in the original training data or as close as the LLM can reproduce them. So LLMs are trained on a veritable flood of data, all the text that its authors could get their hands on. Okay, if that's how LLMs learn, then how do humans learn? For humans, a stupendous amount of repetition also helps. For example, Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule, which says that you can become an expert in any field by spending 10,000 hours of deliberate practice at it. Deliberate practice means you're not just absorbing information, you're trying to produce, you're trying to use that information, you're actually learning something along the way. A little bit analogous to taking a large language model and actually adjusting some of its weights based on the latest value that it predicted. In this video, I'm going to talk mostly about my own experiences, so it's going to be a lot more subjective than usual. But in terms of a flood of language, I do check that box. When I was younger, I was reading about 500 books per year. These were mostly fantasy or fiction books that were pretty short and easy to get through. But yeah, we had several library cards because it was pretty common for one of them to be maxed out at the maximum of 100 books checked out. This probably counts as a stupendous level of repetition of the reading skill. One of the few times when I took an online test that was testing the vocabulary size, I scored top marks and it declared, you are Shakespeare. <laughs> If only my Japanese vocabulary was as good as that. You could argue that the ability to take word completion and apply it to different domains is actually what constitutes intelligence. It's a huge open question in the AI community right now, of course. But certainly applying word completion to different domains and different modalities leads a person to be much more flexible. Apparently, when reading, Romans would always read completely aloud. They would see the text, they would read it aloud, hear their own voice, and then they would understand what it was saying. There was a famous passage by a Roman writer who was astonished to see someone from the Far East reading because that person was able to read silently and his eyes were flying over the page. It takes a lot of repetition to become really good at the four key skills of language, which are speaking, listening, reading, and writing. And the Romans were effectively trying to shortcut not having much reading experience by just leaning on the listening experience. But really having a lot of repetition of reading and reading silently makes you way better at comprehension. And I don't know about you, but I can read text more quickly than most people can speak. So it's a faster way of absorbing information. I have one other story about repetition in different modalities, which is that near the beginning of my PhD, I stopped being able to type English text due to a health condition, and then I switched to doing voice recognition. And at first, when I would use voice recognition to write an email, all my sentences would come out really short and stunted. It sounded like a 10-year-old's writing. And this is because although I had a lot of practice writing by typing and generating sophisticated sentences and ideas, that didn't translate to my speaking ability. Or rather, in the speaking modality, you would usually use short thoughts and less complicated constructions. After only about a year though, my voice recognition ability became just as good as my typing ability. And now I write all my emails via voice recognition, but I'm pretty sure that no one can tell the difference. So what happens in your brain as you're exposed to all of this repetition of information is that your brain builds an amazing language predictor, the exact same way that an LLM builds the next word prediction system. And I'm going to argue in this video that the same way the base model for the LLM is essentially just next word, and then on top of that you build whatever else 
else you're trying to build, for a person, having a really strong command of language enables you to then go out and stack other skills on top of it, especially as it turns out teaching. Because when you teach, you have to explain it in a way that makes sense, not just to you, but actually to your intended audience. So with a weaker command of language, you can probably articulate thoughts in any technical domain in a way that makes sense to you, but it's going to be much harder to adapt your diction and speaking level to people with different needs. Let's talk about learning a new language for a moment. Once you have the basic sounds and grammar rules firmly in your mind, the best thing you can do is to consume as much comprehensible input as possible, which basically means speaking if you can't read yet or reading if you can read. You need to get that repetition train going. In bilingual people or people that are learning another language, when you code switch from one language to another, your brain actually shuts down. It inhibits the neural networks that are used for the other language. So you really can start thinking in the other language and you don't accidentally have things crossing over. Of course, some people practice doing that as well and you get like Spanglish or whatever. But generally speaking, your brain has different language model predictors for different languages that you're fluent in. To me, it's like learning a new modality. Writing emails by typing and writing emails by voice both need lots of repetitions, just as reading English and reading Japanese also need a lot of repetitions. Part two, building up skills. As I mentioned, when I was young, I was reading as much as physically possible. Reading fiction, which built up my language model predictor, and then reading nonfiction for learning new skills and information, and finally doing lots and lots of exercises or self-experimentation. In case you haven't seen my other videos about it, I was actually homeschooled when I grew up. So I really had nothing better to do than to consume information and just get extremely good at being a next word predictor. Later in life, some of the ways that I practiced using this next word predictor was by editing papers and books. As any foreign language learner knows, you have to understand, but you also have to do production of the information. Otherwise, your brain is not going to retain it very well. I also wrote a lot of my own stories and programs. I wanted to be a writer. Well, at least now I'm writing YouTube scripts. That's something. And I was learning how to write code. And of course, I would write my own programs, but I would also go online to programming forums and answer questions every week. Over time, I posted thousands and thousands of answers, most of which required me to Google and look up at least some amount of new information, which was really fun and, of course, really good for training my teaching muscle. It's almost a cliche at this point to say that you have to understand material extremely well to be able to teach it. Even Einstein apparently said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And I'm not going to deny this. When you're teaching, it does help strengthen your understanding, making you realize where you have gaps in your knowledge because you're having to kind of walk over all of the points in your head. And if there's something that you thought you knew, but there's not a lot of actual evidence there, then you'll stumble across it. However, good teaching, in my opinion, also requires the linguistic skill to manage the complexity of ideas and sentences, making sure to introduce them in logical order, making sure to have bite-sized chunks, etc. So although I didn't really know it at the time, I had the perfect formula for learning how to be a good teacher. I was absorbing a flood of text, training my next word predictor, and then focusing on teaching, in this case, mostly computer science, focusing on teaching as a way to learn well. If you look at any university, there are tons of professors that have amazing research, but are really bad at teaching. And I really think it boils down to this being able to manage the complexity of ideas in a linguistic sense. Great teachers in science that I look up to, including Randy Pausch, Richard Feynman, and Stephen Hawking, all have a way with words. And if you've never heard of these gentlemen before, I do suggest you look up some of their videos or books. My book recommendation for this week is Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, which is a fantastic autobiography of one of the most engaging and curious scientists in the world. Whenever I read it, and I do reread it every now and then, it makes me want to learn, it makes me want to be a scientist, and it makes me want to be a teacher. Part three, how I teach. I've kind of said it a few times, but let me spell out how I manage linguistic complexity. Whenever I'm explaining something, I want every new sentence to have roughly the same amount of additional complexity that it introduces. In other words, I don't want to introduce too much stuff all at once using a lot of big words or something like that because then the listener won't understand. Similarly, if you keep repeating the same idea or a sentence only introduces a tiny amount of new delta, then the listener is going to get bored. You want to slice up the information you're presenting into chunks and present each chunk as one sentence or one paragraph or whatever in an easy to understand way and make sure it's not too big or the listener will choke on it. To me, this is very similar, mentally speaking, to what happens when I do copy editing. This was prior to ChatGPT, but I used to be very good at copy editing and I would do it for a lot of people. Copy editing is the last phase of editing. When you're writing some text, you first do like large scale edits and then smaller scale edits. And finally, when you get to copy editing, it basically just means moving the sentences around, introducing slightly different words, that sort of thing. So as a copy editor, one of the main things I would do is make sure each word would be as precise as possible and there's no better word to substitute in. And again, you need a really good next word predictor to be able to do that. And I think my biggest contribution as a copy editor is that I would always break down 
one sentences into approximately the same size chunks. And we're talking amount of new information or cognitive complexity needed to process that chunk. I'm not talking about the actual sentence length. Of course, you actually want variable lengths for your sentences to keep it interesting. So yeah, at one point I actually copy edited a friend's 500 page fantasy novel, which took the better part of a year. Anyway, closely associated with linguistic complexity to me is this idea of choosing the expression you're going to use. Ideally, like a good Gaussian mixture model, you can come up with many ways of saying a given sentence or idea. And you want your brain to suggest all of them to you if you can with the most likely ranked first. And then you can choose the one that's most appropriate for the current situation. Also, mentally modeling the listener is really important. I can, of course, speak or present as I'm doing right now without a live audience. But if there is a live audience, whether in person or virtual, I always want to be able to see them. Each idea that I'm presenting, I'm checking to see, are they nodding? Do they look confused? Are they looking down at their phone? And that allows me to dynamically change which expression selection I would be using. Too many people didn't get it. Okay, slow down, repeat a little bit. Majority of people listening with rapt attention, their eyes straight on you or straight on the camera. That means you're doing a good job. And of course, I've done it often enough that I can do it sort of asynchronously with a YouTube video, but it still helps to actually visualize your target avatar, who you're presenting for, who you're speaking to, and run a mental model of that person or group, because only then can you judge whether you're correctly selecting the right pace, the right level of diction, the right size chunks to present. Finally, in case you're wondering why I teach, why I like teaching, I'll steal Andre Karpathy's line and say, I love happy humans. Yeah, for me, the reason I like teaching just seems to be based in wanting to help other people, altruism, knowing that if I understand something, that's not as good a world if I and all of my friends understand something. Side note, LLMs have the same basis essentially that I do, right? They have an extremely good next word predictor at the basis of everything else they try to do. No wonder they're so good at smooth explanations. They're experts at slicing up information into the right size chunks. Let's just say I don't do copy editing anymore. If you're interested in wondering what you can do to become a better teacher or how to do research, again, I think one of the things I can say is just increase the amount of comprehensible input that you consume, which is basically read lots of books or access text with a high information content and just use your brain for what it does best. Just read, just understand, and eventually start producing if you can, whether that's copy editing or answering people's questions or just explaining things to your friends or dropping ideas in my comments for new videos. All of these things will help establish a strong baseline of linguistic competency that will then make you a better teacher as well as at a lot of other communication type skills. By the way, if you're interested in learning either how to teach or how to do research, I'll leave two comments below and please thumbs up the appropriate one and that'll help me decide whether to make more videos on these subjects. And finally, announcements. There's two of them. First of all, I was planning to make a Discord channel for this community for all of you, my viewers, where you can go and ask questions and have conversations. And I do want to use it as a source for new videos as well. So you can post links to interesting things or suggest new ideas. I do want to warn you that I'm not super good at keeping up with text messages. So I may not reply all that frequently, but if that starts to become a problem, I'll make sure there's a separate thread or section for comments that are addressed to me directly. And just as I was thinking of making this Discord channel, someone on my last video actually put in a request for it. So here it is. Check out the link in the description for the Discord channel. And second announcement, I'm also going to create a mailing list for people that don't like using Discord. And I don't know what I'll use it for yet. Maybe merch announcements, who knows, but I won't bombard you. I'll try to use it at most monthly once I actually start using it. It did occur to me, for example, that when my friend's novel gets published, the one that I edited, perhaps people would be interested in having a link to it. So I could use the mailing list for that sort of information. Finally, most important information will probably be in both the mailing list and the Discord server. So if you have a strong preference for one of these mediums and you want to sign up for only one of them, that's probably fine. That's it. That's the announcements. I really look forward to seeing you guys in Discord and signing up for my mailing list because I really love that we have a community that likes to comment and make suggestions and whatnot in the YouTube comments. And I think these are even better forums for that sort of thing. Finally, in conclusion, we talked about how having a flood of language, a flood of comprehensible input is really important to building a really good next word predictor in your brain. And that next word predictor allows you to be more eloquent, which allows you to see multiple paths forward when you're trying to figure out the best way to say something, which finally makes you much better at many types of communication, including teaching. And we drew that comparison to large language models because they're trained essentially the same way, first by just predicting the next word and then by customizing to a specific task, which is why I think LLMs are so smooth at producing really understandable prose and making sure that there's appropriately sized chunks of information in all the sentences and paragraphs. I really think that as a teacher, if you can manage the linguistic complexity of what you're saying, then that will really make you seem eloquent and approach the abilities of the great teachers of the world. Let me know if you'd be interested in seeing more material on how to teach or how to do research.
research, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the Discord server. If you liked this video, check out this previous one I made about how AI is transforming education and how we're all getting personalized tutors. I also talk in that video about my own history some more and about my homeschooling experience. I think you'll enjoy it. Well, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.